Hello, everyone. Welcome to the lecture, Can I Become Rich from Shares? by uh, Professor Dr. Patrick Verweimeren. I am very happy that you are all here today in the room and also the people who are watching from home. Good that you're here. Welcome, everyone. My name is Lenja Slierendrecht and I work as a program maker, programma maker for Studium Generale. And I organize all kinds of things like the lecture today, but also uh, open stage nights, film screenings, uh, debates, uh, several things. And if you want to know more, you can follow us through uh, SG Erasmus on socials. I am very happy that today's guest is here uh, for us to speak about the stock market, because in my surroundings, and I can imagine in yours as well, or maybe you even do it yourself, a lot of people are investing in stocks. And that is understandable. Um, because the saving rates are historically low and the housing prices are high. And if you want to invest, buying stock seems a very uh, a good option. But how does the stock market actually work? Young and old are investing in crypto, windmills, Tesla. Is this a case of fear of missing out or is it actually smart? Can you get rich on the stock market quickly? I'd like to mention that today's lecture is um, being recorded for the people watching from home. So if you have a question, you can uh, best keep it uh, until, the, until the end, and then me or my colleague will come with a microphone so that the people from watching from home can hear it too. Patrick Verweimeren is a professor of corporate finance at Erasmus School of Economics, and he uh, regularly gives lectures like today. He did it at the uh, Universiteit van Nederland, University of the Netherlands, uh, TEDx, and at Studio Erasmus. And today he is going to tell us all about the stock market. Give him a warm hand of applause, Patrick Verweimeren. Thank you very much for this really nice uh, introduction. So the topic of my uh, talk, you can't see my share screen. is investing in shares, or the science of investing. I, I'm not a professional trader, I'm an academic. So uh, what we as academics do is uh, study the, uh, the stock market. I'll uh, mostly have this talk for people who are not familiar with, with shares and investing. So I know maybe some of you do, so if there are questions that are maybe more Advanced, we can always uh, chat after the, uh, the talk or ask questions after the meeting. Uh, but let me actually ask, who of you invests in shares? So not through your pension fund, but directly uh, in shares. So roughly half. Uh, that is pretty typical, I think, for people in their uh, 20s these days. So in the Netherlands, about four out of 10 people who are in their 20s uh, invest in the stock market. Right, and again, not through their pension fund, many also do it indirectly, but directly uh, by buying shares, investing in an index, or buying crypto. And these four out of 10 people, these 40% of people in the 20s, they actually, these three options, they're sort of split uh, pretty fairly. So there's a big proportion uh, of the 40% that only invests in shares, that picks shares. Uh, a big portion that chooses an index to invest in, and a big portion that buys crypto. And of course, some do multiple of these uh, things. So what can we say uh, is uh, recommendable from a scientific uh, perspective? What can I say about uh, these things? Uh, why do we see more and more people investing? Well, I'm not sure this is science, but what you sort of uh, see happening is that there are developments that sort of drive people towards the stock market. And one of these things, and this has been for a while now, is that uh, interest rates are low, especially your savings account will not give you a high return. Right? If you have money on your savings account, your interest rate is probably zero, or 0.01%, or something super low. So something that you put on your savings account a year back probably is still uh, has the same amount, but it's maybe worth less because inflation now is high. Right? So the number of uh, things you can buy with your money actually decreases. Uh, this doesn't go well with people. If they don't see their money growing on, on their savings account, they start looking for alternatives. Right? And then investing in shares is maybe an obvious one. Now also that inflation is high, there's even more drive maybe to start looking for investment opportunities because your money becomes worth less if you just put it on a savings account. So that is one driver. Uh, another driver is that uh, you can invest through your smartphone. 
Uh, this makes it maybe easier, more fun. So it's uh, sort of the uh, restrictions you have to invest uh, are very low. And it's pretty easy now to invest in stocks or uh, in other uh, assets. Uh, maybe also more fun, right? You can check it uh, all the time. There, there are apps that have all these uh, particular features, and I'll get to talk a bit about those. Uh, but that makes it that people don't really see a high hurdle to investing in the stock market. So in a way, if part of my message is that investing in stocks makes sense, then this is a good development, right? That there's not a high hurdle to uh, enter this market. Thanks. Uh, a final reason that uh, is maybe uh, pretty relevant is that there's this fear of missing out. I guess most of you would know somebody or have seen a video of people really saying, oh, I made so much money, why don't you try as well? And it's sort of hard if you hear all these stories of people that invested in Bitcoin and made a lot of money, you start thinking, maybe I should do the same. I had the fear of missing out. Everybody else is doing it and is doing it well, so maybe I should join. And you also have uh, influencers on social media also posting these, these messages on how well they're doing and trying to uh, convince you to, to do the same. Uh, influencers in finance are influencers, uh, And these, of course, could also be informative, but you have to take into account that the people that don't do well, they probably do not record these videos. Right? So the people that sh tell them how they did, these are probably the, uh, the selected sample that did well, but that need not be representative of how uh, the others are doing. But these are some reasons why you see more and more people, uh, also younger people, uh, join, uh, join the stock market. So uh, to start really from the beginning, a share. What is a share? What is a share worth? Well, first, what is a share? Right, so a share, a part. A part of what? And then you buy a share, you buy a portion of something, but of what? Uh, it's, a, it's a share of ownership. So when you buy a share, you buy a share of ownership uh, of a company. Maybe not something everybody realizes. So all the shareholders together, they own the company. They're the owners. Right, managers should really listen to what they want. If you own a share, uh, you have a right to vote at the annual meeting. So you're partly an owner of a company. So a share is basically owning a portion uh, of a company. But what's a share worth? Uh, maybe the simplest way of explaining this is by something I saw uh, in the news a few days back, which is in Belgium, you can also buy a share on a painting. So for 150 euros, you can buy a share in a painting, uh, of a painting. So think of this as a very simple firm. Right? The firm, don't think of a complicated firm, but a super simple firm. It only has one asset. It only has one thing. It's a painting. And say this painting is worth 150,000. Right? It was just traded on the star, uh, on, on, at an auction for 150,000 euros. Well, if this simple company that just owns one painting issues 1,000 shares, so all of you will get 1,000th own, uh, ownership in this company, uh, then your, your share value will be 150. Right? Because all shareholders together, they own the firm, so if the firm is worth 150,000 and the firm issues 1,000 shares, then each share is worth 150. If the painting gets very popular, right? if this, this art style gets more popular or this artist gets more popular, and you think you can now auction it off for, say, 200,000, then the value of one share will be 200, right? will go up. There will be many people who want to pay more than 150. I don't want to pay 160, or 170, 180, 190, uh, up to 200. So you'll get demand. Right? In the end, share prices is just a matter of supply and demand. But it just is really uh, a strict link to the value of the company. Right? So if we move away again from the painting, but to complex companies, there's no difference. Right, again, if you know the value of the company and you know the number of shares, then you know uh, the share price. Then you basically know what one share should be worth. So if the company gets worth more, uh, the share gets worth more. And that's basically what a share uh, is worth. But how do you value a company? That depends on all the future profits you expect. And if, you come, if you expect the company to do very well, to get really uh, bring in a lot of money in the future, and then this company is worth a lot, so for a given number of shares, you expect a higher share price. And so instead of thinking, what could we sell this painting at, at an auction in a few years, you just have to think about what are the profits, expected profits of this company in the future. And this is what you need to get the value of a share, to calculate the value of a share. So can I tell you which uh, share to pick? 
right, if we're thinking of, we're doing a lot of research into looking into shares. Uh, so Tesla has a share, Heineken has a share, uh, Unilever, uh, Philips. Uh, companies around the world, they've issued shares. Can I tell you which one you should buy? Turns out uh, that's pretty hard. So stock picking uh, is not so simple, and that's because these uh, prices already uh, contain a lot of information. But if you're interested in stock markets and you track prices through the day on your app, potentially, you would see that it moves a lot. And whenever there's new information, the price uh, responds. So if I'm thinking, say I have an iPhone and I really like this iPhone, and I'm thinking, wow, Apple is a pretty good company because they make pretty good phones. I, I should maybe buy a stock of Apple. Will this be a good investment? Uh, that's not so clear. But even if Apple is a good company, the fact that these iPhones do well, that they sell well, that they're popular, uh, many people already know this. So many people would already have bought Apple if they, uh, if, if they consider this important information. So if you're trading on information that everybody already knows, uh, it doesn't say much about what the stock price will do in the future. Right? It will only change if the expected profits in the future change. So maybe if you, if you know more than others, uh, then it could be uh, worthwhile to think about a particular stock. But this is hard. So this is when many people have uh, the same information. But let me tell you about uh, a case where only a few people had some information. What is this then easily? Uh, how does the stock market work then? So we go all the way back to 1986, uh, when we had this Challenger Space Shuttle uh, there being launched. Uh, and unfortunately, a big tragedy happened. Uh, it seemed to explode. So uh, a big fireball, a big disaster. People died. Uh, the newspapers the next morning were, wow, what happened? What went wrong? What was really uh, going on here? Because you can imagine a space shuttle is a very, very complicated piece of machinery. It, com it, it consists of many, many components, many different parts. So if in the far distance you see it exploding, or it, it seemed to be exploding, it was unclear what caused it. Right? The next day, they didn't know. Uh, in fact, there was a scientific committee established, and they researched this for weeks and weeks and weeks. Right? And then much later, they came up with a conclusion that it was a pretty small part that caused this tragedy. Right? It was this, these rubber rings that were part of a, of, of a space shuttle because at the day of the launch it was pretty cold, it wasn't flexible enough anymore, and that caused, in the end, uh, the uh, uh, malfunction. So a small part, in the end, was responsible. Uh, they found out much later. So what did the stock market do? So this is the day of the crash, uh, January 28th in 1986. Uh, there were four companies that were responsible for, the lo for a lot of the parts of the space shuttle. So we had Lockheed, Rockwell International, Martin Marietta, and Morden Vehicle. And here, you would see the stock prices uh, during that day. So in this axis, we have the, exp uh, the explosion, the, the disaster, and then the stock prices start falling, all four of them. Uh, some sort of stop falling when we're about minus two to minus three percent. And this could be an indication of uh, shareholders of these firms thinking, wow, there is this disaster, this will hurt the space program, maybe NASA will now invest less, so our company is hurt. But there was one company already in, in right after the crash that just started falling, 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 losing almost 12% of its share price. So the stock market, for some reason, seemed to be pretty quick in pointing out uh, who was guilty of the mistake. Well, what turned out, weeks and weeks later, they were right, more than vehicle, was the one who was responsible for the faulty uh, component. So the stock market reacts super fast to information that only a few people have. Uh, maybe a few people at NASA had suspic suspicions or a few engineers in this company, but this was not public knowledge. And so the stock market is very uh, fast in incorporating uh, information. Uh, and this was 1986. So imagine what happens today. If news comes out, if something happens, stock markets are super fast in reacting. Uh, we have all these professional traders with all their screens watching all this information uh, coming out, right? News releases, press releases, earnings announcements, uh, news about the economy, everything they have to process super fast. Uh, there, is a, there are also a lot of algorithms. 
Uh, you don't even have to read a press release anymore. An algorithm is pretty fast in picking out positive words, negative words, linking it to uh, which company it is about, and sort of adjusting uh, it's what, what, uh, what, a comp what a share is worth uh, very fast. So this happens super, super fast now. And one example is uh, a tweet by Kylie Jenner. So does anyone else not open Snapchat anymore? Or is it just me? Ah, this is so sad. Uh, so now I'm not talking about earnings announcement or some big company announcement. No, just a celebrity posting something on Twitter. What happened? Well, uh, in one tweet, Kylie Jenner wiped out 1.3 billion of Snap's market value. So even to these things, the stock market reacts super fast. So uh, the point of this story is picking a stock hard. Uh, yeah, it is. So it is hard to just think about a single stock that will do really well that you should invest in. And you can try this. So if you don't believe me, you can easily track stock prices on the internet or in newspapers or uh, multiple different ways. So if you think carefully about a stock that you think will do really well, a company, uh, and you put some money in it, or not even, but you just track the stock price, my prediction is that if you would set this against some random stocks, right, so ex besides the company you think very carefully about, you also invest or you supposedly track some random companies, uh, my prediction is that these random companies will not do worse. Right? Maybe a few will do worse, a few will do better. So you can do this yourself. Right? Think carefully about, okay, maybe I want to invest in this company, then track the stock price for the next month. Also pick, I don't know, the first three companies you come across and track those stock prices. And then my prediction is that your company won't be the one that performs best. Well, maybe one out of four times it will. But. So uh, this is hard. Do I say this because I don't trust you or me in investing? No, even professional traders have huge trouble, so why is there a monkey with bananas? Uh, it is because we organize a game every year, uh, as a, uh, or the professionals in, in investing do so. So the game is that these uh, stock market professionals, these professional investors, they think carefully about which stocks they want to invest in, uh, and then they compete against, well, against the monkey. The monkey just eats randomly some bananas, and these bananas would have company names on them. And so this is how the monkey chooses its portfolio. We have the professionals choosing uh, their portfolio. And this is an actual game. I think about any other industry where this would be a game, that the professionals uh, really have to f uh, are happy when they beat randomness. And in fact, many times the professionals lose. So it's very tricky to do better than random. So what then? Uh, well, I'll get to this uh, by thinking about a company, uh, GameStop. You might have heard about it. So uh, in, in the prior slide, it was really about a lot of information being into stock price. It's really hard to beat the market. This is what we call the stock market being efficient, being rational. Is this a full story? No, there are weird things in the stock market. Uh, this is one example, GameStop. So this is basically what GameStop is doing. You see a physical store selling games. Uh, maybe this is not the best store to have anymore because more and more moves online. That's how the stock price, the profits of GameStop, say in 2020 or before, weren't so good anymore. Stock prices uh, went down a bit. And early January 2021, the stock price of GameStop was $20. Well, what happened then is that uh, people found out that besides people buying the share, you also had investors, big investors, uh, taking opposite positions, short selling the share. So maybe not super important for you, but you can buy a share, but you can also bet on stock prices going down. And you basically sell a share that you don't yet, yet have, short selling. And so I'm selling a share now uh, for 20, but I will buy it in the future, so I hope in the future the stock price is very low, uh, so I make a profit. And so you have short sellers uh, and people that buy shares, that have long positions. The people that started uh, looking, these, these retailers, these gamers that started looking into GameStop, they didn't like these short sellers. They said, well, we should maybe do something uh, to piss them off. 
maybe we should all start buying GameStop. Right? On these social media platforms, on these trading platforms, they all started sending messages, let's buy GameStop. Right? So these short sellers make a big loss. Well, this got pretty big. So in the end, millions and millions of people started buying uh, GameStop, uh, and the share price rose later that month to 347. Uh, of course, the business didn't change so much. Right? Maybe there's a lot of demand for the stock based on these platforms, but I've explained to you a value of a stock should represent basically the value of the business. And GameStop still had these physical stores that were still in a bit of trouble. So you might be able to predict what happens. The stock price falls back to 40 in, in February. Right, so maybe there was more attention now for the stock. It made the news a lot. So maybe the stock price should be a bit higher. Right? Maybe uh, they came up with new ideas or people got interested. So 20 to 40 is fine. But this ridiculous stock price of 347, uh, this really shows how risky it, be, it can be to invest uh, in a single stock. Was anybody of you involved in GameStop? No? That's good news. I imagine buying at 347 and then the stock price falling to 40. Right, then you probably stop investing uh, straight away. Uh, uh, the stock price did sort of recover a little bit afterwards, went up a little bit afterwards, because they then changed their strategy. Right? People really got involved. Uh, but this is an example, I think, of where maybe prices aren't really rational. There's sort of weird things going on. But it also shows how risky it can be to invest in a single stock. Picking a stock is risky because the company uh, can go bankrupt, meaning stock price goes to zero, or it can fluctuate a lot. So what then? Uh, and this is the question that researchers, that science uh, academics face as well. What can we really tell about the stock market looking at, uh, at a lot of data, historical data? Well, and the starting point here is that risk and return are related. So in Finance 101, this is basically where we start off. Risk and return are highly related. So if you think of putting your money in a savings account, uh, there's almost no risk. Right? You're pretty sure your money will still be there in a year, but that's why your return is also very low. Right? Low uh, risk, low return. If you buy a bond, so you, can, you have governments and companies also borrowing money. So you, as an investor, can lend them money. Right? You lend them $1,000. They promise to pay you back. Uh, a government would maybe pay you 2% per year and then pay you back. A company uh, has a higher chance of going bankrupt, so they would offer you more. A risky company uh, would, again, offer you more, maybe 7% to borrow money from you. And so the more risk you face, the higher the return you ask. Uh, in shares, it's the same. So if we have savings accounts there and bonds here, then shares would be uh, pretty up there. Right? Some shares, they fluctuate a lot, high risk, but that's why they also, on average, offer a high return. Right? If you think of crypto or so, it would be, uh, the risk would be even higher based on how much it fluctuates. So we have risk and return being strongly related. Can I then say which is, uh, what is best? Right? So I can't say which stock is best, but can I at least say saving is better than investing or the other way around? Uh, no, it depends on how much risk you want to take. That's also there, there's no clear answer that one is better than the other. But look at this uh, red dot. So the red dot there. Uh, there's pretty, pretty clear that this is not optimal. Right now we have a share, say, with a high risk but a low return. You should not invest in this share. And why not? Well, for the sa same amount of risk, you can have a much higher expected return. Or in other words, for same expected return, you can have a much lower risk. So the red dot is a suboptimal investment. But now we come closer to what is then optimal. And what is optimal apparently is to have a highest possible return for the lowest possible risk. So this is the goal. I this sort of the scientific a quest into thinking about investing is optimizing uh, the return versus risk relation. We want as high return as possible for as low uh, a risk as possible. Well, I simplified this the most I could. 
So how to think about this? Think of a very simple economy, an island. They're just two companies. Uh, one company sells sunglasses. One company sells umbrellas. That's super simple. Cannot be simpler. Well, what are the uh, expected returns of these companies? Well, think of the sunglass company. Uh, if it's a sunny year, right, so this year is pretty sunny, then this is good for this company. They try to sell sunglasses. Uh, if, if the weather is good, people buy more sunglasses. Their stock price increases by 10%. If it rains a lot, stock price doesn't move. Right, so there'll be a 0% return if it rains, but if it's sunny, it goes up by 10%. But what about the other company? Uh, the umbrella company, the other way around. If it's a rainy year, many people buy umbrellas, stock price goes up by 10%, but nothing happens uh, in the other scenario if it's sunny. Well, what we need to know is how often it rains. Well, say this island is close to the Netherlands, so it's sort of 50-50. Can be a sunny year, can be a rainy year. But what can I say about investing in these companies? Well, let me invest in the sunglass company. I have a sunny personality, I think I'm optimistic. I'll buy the sunglass company. What do I expect for profits? Well, if it's sunny, I get 10% on the 100, so I earn 10 euros. If it's rainy, I don't earn anything. Uh, well, it's 50-50, right, whether it will be rainy or sunny. So uh, the average between these two is five euro profit. I expect to make a five euro profit. Is this a risky investment? Yeah, it is, because there's a 50% probability I end up with zero profit, but then I don't make any money. Well, if you're less optimistic and you want to uh, invest in the umbrella company, well, what do you get? Well, if it's sunny, you get zero. If it's rainy, you get 10 euros. So also you, on average, will get five euros. But also you run a big risk of ending up with zero profit on your investment. So now uh, it comes. What can I also do? I can split. I can spread and invest 50 euros in the sunglass company and 50 euros in the umbrella company. What will happen? Well, if it's sunny, uh, I get 10% return on my 50 euros on sunglasses, so I get 5 euros there. Uh, the company that sells umbrellas doesn't make a uh, the stock price doesn't go up, so I earn 5 euros. If it's rainy, uh, the stock price doesn't move for the sunglass company, but the stock price goes up by 10% for the umbrella company, so I make five euros there. So what is my expected profit now? Well, regardless of whether it's sunny or rainy, I know my profit will be five euros. So now I have the same return, but I have a much lower risk. I have zero risk in this example. And so by spreading, I can sort of optimize the return versus risk relation. I can really decrease the risk that I'm facing. So if you make this more uh, realistic, you end up with uh, bigger portfolios where you should take into account all the risks uh, of companies, but also how they relate to one another. So this is optimal portfolio theory. Uh, Markovic, heavily involved, winning him the 1990 Nobel Prize uh, in economics. Uh, so he really thought carefully about the risks, risk of a portfolio. Uh, these are all things you can calculate. I, I, I give this whole talk without any formula or any mathematics, but uh, you can actually do calculations. Right? The expected return, you can look at the stock prices in the past right? to sort of see how, on average, a stock behaves. You can look at the risk of a stock in the past. Right? Does it fluctuate a lot, or is it pretty uh, stable? Uh, so this is what uh, you then do. So if you have, have a portfolio of stocks, so you have different shares that you're buying, uh, you have to think about the risk of, say, stock one. How much does it move? This is important for the risk of your portfolio, if you have multiple ones. Uh, you also think about the risk of stock two. Right? So I care about the risk of the umbrella company, I care about the risk of the sunglass company, but I also really care about their covariance, how much they move together. Do they all move in the same direction? Right? If the economy is doing well, do they both then go up? Or do they sort of move uh, in opposite directions or are maybe not so strongly related? So when one goes up, it doesn't really say anything about the other. So this is the covariance, how well they move together. Uh, so in the example, they really were opposites. This doesn't really happen in practice so much. But of course, shares that need not be related so, uh, so heavily. If you're worried that another pandemic will break out, 
then maybe you should buy a, uh, uh, an online company, re an online retailer, or a supermarket, right? They did pretty well during the pandemic, but you should also then buy, say, an air flight company or a, a cruise liner who do pretty poorly when there's a pandemic, right? So here you have stocks that don't always strongly move in the same direction. So uh, it's about how things move together and about the risk of, of uh, single stocks. But then we add more stocks and more and more. And we do all these calculations. Right? So you get all these red dots or dots in the, uh, the figure I showed. Right? If we have these four stocks, we have this expected return against this risk. If we have another four stocks, we have this expected return against this risk. Uh, if we have five stocks, this happens. So you get all these dots. And you say, well, we pick the one that's closest to having the high, highest uh, return risk relation. Well, what well, turns out, if you have six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, so on stocks, say up to 20 stocks, uh, it's not so much about the risk of a stock anymore, but it's really about the covariance. And you can already see this in this uh, matrix, that if we only have five stocks, that's so why I, I add a fifth stock, so there's some risk of the company. But what I also add is the covariance between stock five and stock four, stock five and stock three, stock five and stock two, stock five and stock one. So I'm adding a lot of uh, uh, covariances and not so much the risk of a single company. So the bigger this is, the more it's really about how things move together. So optimal investing is then not about looking at single stocks so much, but really thinking about how you can diversify how you can sort of not put all your eggs in one basket, but really look at different types of companies. So the advice, what comes out of optimal portfolio theory, if you want to simplify it a lot, is that you should really invest in uh, different industries or different countries. I really look for stocks that do not move so much in line with other stocks. This is what really helps you uh, to reduce the risk and optimize your return versus risk relation. So again, you could do this with all your, in your Excel spreadsheet, do all these calculations. Uh, because it matters so much how things uh, move together, it's so important to spread. The simple strategy is to just invest in an index. So what is index investing? It's a passive investment technique that attempts to generate returns similar to a broad market index. So instead of really thinking about each company carefully, you would just buy the whole IX index, or the whole market index, or the world index. Right? Not every stock in there, but an instrument that tracks the index. Right? So they do this for you. Uh, if you invest do index investing, the company you do this through, they make sure they track a given index. So the Dutch stock index, or world stock index, or the US stock index. So by doing this, you're pretty well diversified. You reduce your risk, but your return could still be pretty good. So this is index investing. Uh, so in the beginning, I, I told you already, the, the portion of, of Dutch people in their 20 who do index investing is roughly the same as people who, who pick stocks. But scientifically, index investing uh, uh, seems preferable unless you really pick a lot of stocks and diversify well in that way. Index investing also allows you to uh, maybe not invest in, in the whole index, but maybe only in socially responsible companies. This is what you see now as well. Right, so instead of tracking the whole index, you only track uh, companies that do pretty well on social responsible uh, index scores, right, that don't really pollute the environment so much or, or, or things along these lines. Right, if researchers look into the returns of this kind of investments, uh, it's, not, it's not worse than, than general index investing, it seems. And there's some mixed evidence, but it seems if you say, uh, you leave out a few companies, really polluting companies, uh, but you only invest in the, uh, the ones that do really well on, on say, social responsibility or, or doing well for the environment, then the average returns and risk are not so different from this portfolio that does include these sin stocks or these uh, polluting stocks. Right, so in that sense, you can really be diversified, uh, but you can still make choices there in what you, uh, what, what you go for. Uh, well, index investing, so the simplest way, you just invest in a stock. It, it, something that tracks the whole market, say the Dutch stock market or the American stock market. If you want to think of how well, how much does this earn you, then we can really look back, say, 100 years. We have data going a long way back from how markets have performed over time. So here we have a lot of historical data. Uh, and of course, it depends a bit on the country or 
uh, or, or which stocks uh, stock index you look at, right? Just the, all the big firms or all the firms. But the average annual returns over the past hundred years are five, between five and ten percent in stock markets. So each year, uh, on average, the stock market will go up, say, by eight percent. Uh, is this super important? The eight uh, percent. Well, it turns out to be because if you get this every year, uh, your sort of your money grows exponentially. And this is much easier to explain since the pandemic uh, because you're pretty familiar with this R figure, I'm guessing. Uh, with the coronavirus, uh, if the R is above one, you would see it spreading pretty fast. Uh, 100 infected people will infect more than 100 people who will again infect more people. And we saw a number of infections rising pretty fast. Uh, you're, I think you still remember these exponential lines, or for you did. Uh, the same, of course, uh, if you get 8% return on your portfolio each year. But you also grow faster and faster. So maybe 10% is easier to do calculations with. So if you invest 100 euros and you get a 10% return, then yeah, the first year you get 10 euros. But then you have 110. So if you can get 10%, you already get 11. Right? 121. If you again get 10%, you get the next year you get more than 12 already. So it grows faster and faster. The first year is maybe not super exciting, but if you do this over time, uh, then it starts increasing super fast. So this graph shows you if you invested 100 euros 100 years back, well, assuming we had euros at the time, uh, then currently this would be worth more than 200,000 uh, euros. And if only your ancestors uh, had done this. Uh, of course, your ancestors didn't have euros, plus there's inflation that you should take into account. Right? If inflation is super high, then maybe uh, it, it's less impressive than it seems. But still, this exponential uh, line is really what makes stock investing in the long term uh, really interesting. If you would just put your money on a savings account without interest, uh, you would, of course, be stuck with the same uh, 100 euros. So there the difference is enormous. So diversified investing, this is basically what the science of investing from an academic viewpoint uh, is. Uh, so it's really for the long run. Right? Even if you study the markets for years, it's super hard to predict what will happen next month or next year. But in the next, over the next decade, over 10 years, over 20 years, over 30 years, well, based on what we've seen in the past, uh, over longer periods of time, we've also always seen the stock price, uh, stock market go up. And it fluctuates, it can lose a lot of money uh, next year or next week, but over the long run, in the past, we've always seen it uh, gone up. As again, the 8% is an average, it does fluctuate, but for the long run, uh, it seems optimal to at least invest some of your money if you have it uh, in shares. Uh, what is an also a, a, a good advice is to spread over time. Right, so besides spreading over different stocks, you might also really want to spread when you get into, when you, when you put in your money. Right, so instead of putting all your money in now, oh, we don't know what happens next week or the week after. So you might as well put in some amount every month or every year. So in addition to spreading over stocks, you spread over time. Uh, the goal, of, of course, is to get in where the stock price is as low as possible. But yeah, that's hard to know. Right? Even if it has gone down, who knows whether it goes up quickly or whether it keeps going down. But of course, if you have any insight, uh, it's useful to get in low and get out high. But if you don't have insight, like I think goes for, for most people, spreading over time makes sense. What some people do is when they, whenever they get a raise from work, then this is the amount, the additional amount they get uh, as a salary, this is the amount they put on their, their uh, investment account uh, every month. So it's for the long run, spread over time, and important, uh, but investing in, in shares typically is, it's that you do it with money you do not, do not need in the short run. Uh, so not money you need for groceries or, or to replace your washing machine, uh, again, we don't know what happens to your money in the next week or month. Stock prices are unpredictable. Uh, so, and I guess that's why you would invest uh, as well. It's really in the long run to maybe retire faster or 
go on expensive holidays later on, your life, later on in your life. Right? Don't use the money you really need now. Uh, how would you do this? Well, there are multiple ways. I talked about these apps. Uh, most people would do it, or I think it's, it's, it's easy to do it through a bank. Right? A bank, you can just walk in and say, well, I, I, I want to invest, uh, and I want to do it diversified. Then they would look at your risk profile. They would find out how much risk you're willing to take, and they can diversify uh, for you. But they would also then think about other uh, uh, assets that could be in your portfolio. So it doesn't have to stop with different shares. You can include bonds in your portfolio as well, or the bank can do it for you. If you're very wealthy, uh, buying real estate or gold uh, is also a good investment. And why? Uh, well, again, think about how things relate, these covariances. Right? If you're really looking, uh, if you really want to optimize returns versus risk, you're looking for assets that do not covary, co-move so much with stocks. Right? So then gold is typically mentioned. Right, that gold is pretty stable. If stock markets crash, then maybe gold keeps its value. Right? Or real estate. Well, currently, housing prices are very high. But there are also instances where they don't move in line with, with stock markets. Right? And bonds as well. So uh, if you think of by diversification, you can even go beyond uh, the stock market. Art is, well, uh, art is something I've done research about, uh, because you can also think of paintings. People often said uh, paintings are very good for diversification. And this could be, right? When we had, I remember the, the, the crisis 2007, 8, 9, and stock prices were falling, the global financial crisis, you still had art prices going through the roof. I had hundreds of millions going to paintings. So people said, well, instead of investing in stocks, you should really invest in, in paintings. Uh, well, maybe, uh, not, maybe the answer is not so strongly that this doesn't move with stocks. Uh, these were just some people that still want to show it off, like, ah, oh, we're still doing well. We're paying 100 million for a painting. Uh, most paintings lost value as well during, during this crisis. So they, it's not that they completely, the paintings are completely isolated from movements in the world. But art could also be a good diversification uh, mechanism. So I've done research about this, looking at, at art auctions. And I get to see all these auction data from Christie's and Sotheby's around the world. So you, you see them selling paintings. You see people buying, uh, paying something for paintings. And I see the same painting selling multiple times over time. And I see this Picasso selling in New York in the 80s and then in the 90s uh, in London. So I can easily calculate what the return is on this painting, this average return. I do this for thousands and thousands of paintings. So I, I get to see how much uh, art prices move around uh, uh, over time. And also, that is not a bad investment. So the average return is roughly 6%. So if you're able to buy paintings, and not a Picasso, right? Uh, I look at paintings that sell for 1,000 euros or, or something along these lines. Uh, then that seems to be a pretty good investment for diversification purposes as well. And of course, you have to transport this painting, and you, there, you have to insure it maybe, so there's additional cost. Uh, but at least you have something to look at. Right? This might be uh, not a bad investment at all, especially if you want to diversify. And this is, I think, where crypto comes in a bit as well. Uh, for many people, just investing in cryptocurrencies is super risky. But as a diversification uh, mechanism, it seems pretty suitable. I think that it seems to sort of have a life of its own. It's not highly related to the traditional markets. So maybe a small portion, or uh, depending on your risk profile, uh, a portion of crypto in your, in your portfolio could be, uh, could be worthwhile. I'll get back to uh, crypto. Uh, at the end, uh, a few trends. One is gamification. So when I mentioned apps, uh, again, research has shown that in the past, at least, that investing in shares could, be, uh, could lead to pretty good returns. So that apps make it easier seems like a good thing. But gamification is something that you see more recently. So this is the use of game design elements in non-game context. Investing is not a game, but these apps, some of them, they sort of turn it into a game. Right? When there's confetti if you make a trade, or flashing colors, or you get achievements, or you get advice. Right? Where they really turn it into sort of a tournament or a game. Uh, what are the effects there? 
And there, how science can come in is by doing online experiments. So this is what researchers from Toronto did. They did an online experiment uh, to study the impact of, this, of these gamification things on how uh, traders, uh, the des decisions they would make. And so they would build uh, an app, a website. Uh, they had all these participants. Some participants got the, the trading app without all these additional features, these gamification features. And some of the participants got the gamification website. And then they looked at the difference in their trades. Well, what did they find? Well, they found that the one that has gamification really leads participants to take on more risk. Uh, and especially for inexperienced traders that didn't know so much about finance. And this is something I think this is just a first study, so more research has to be done. But if this is really true, then this is something I think to, to be aware of. That all these additional features in these apps, uh, that they could lead you to take maybe more risk than you would otherwise take. Right? Especially if you haven't traded much in the past, uh, or you don't understand the stock market so well. So something to be uh, aware of. Uh, another trend, of course, is uh, crypto. Uh, from a scientific viewpoint, yeah, what can I say? We see it more as speculation, more as gambling. Right? Stock investing, we have data from over 100 years. Right? We, we have seen all these stock prices move in the past. Crypto, we don't have all these data. So uh, it's much harder to say things uh, about it from a scientific perspective. Right? It's a lot of speculation, it's gambling. We see this going to a casino. Uh, of course, there's much more behind it. Right? And uh, I think one thing to, to, to highlight here uh, as, uh, at the end of my talk is that this is a market where investor sophistication is sort of highly varied. Right? You'd have people investing in, in crypto or uh, cryptocurrencies or, or other coins because they're, they're highly knowledgeable and they follow these, these technologies. They might have a chance of predicting which will be dominant in the future, what will work. But you also have many, many people investing in this market that are maybe not such an expert. So in these young markets, investor sophistication is maybe not as high as in, say, traditional markets with all these big institutional traders. So uh, something, an experiment that, that uh, Richard Thaler did already a while back, uh, in the financial time, is to ask a question when we have sort of such a, a game. Right? You're trying to win, but it's really about, it's not only about uh, information anymore. It's not only about calculations. I think of Bitcoin, can we calculate what it's worth? It's not like a, uh, something like, like a company where you think about what the profits will be, it's harder. So there's maybe more at play. So this was the question that Richard Thaler asked in the financial times. Choose a number between one and 100. Uh, it's a game, you wanna win. And the winning entry will be the one closest to two thirds of the average entry. Simple question. So I'll think about it for 10 seconds. So you're trying to win. Uh, if I go to the front row, what, what number would you pick? 88. 88. 40. 40. 35. 35. No clue. Uh, 88, 40, 35. So what would the average be between those? Uh, say 50. So then the winning number would be two thirds of 50, so that would be 33. All right, so with these, say these three are representable, representative for all of you, uh, then the winning entry would be roughly 33. Uh, but think about this game carefully. So the winner, the winners is two thirds of the average. So imagine you're smart, but you don't think the rest is very very smart, very informed. So you think everybody else will just pick randomly. They would just pick a number. Uh, if everybody would just randomly pick a number, the average will be 50, basically what happened here. Right? If people randomly pick numbers, the average will be 50, so the winner will be 33. That means if you're smart, but you think the other's not. Uh, 
But what if somebody else is smarter? What would that smarter person do? Well, the smarter person will think, ah, these other people are smart. They picked 33 because they want to win. What will I pick? I'll pick 22. I'll pick two thirds of 33. But I think you can see where this goes. If, if you're even smarter, you think, ah, all these other people, they'll pick 22. I'll pick two thirds of 22. Well, another, well, again, the smarter the people get, in the end, they'll pick one. So if people are super informed, they can do all the calculations, they understand what the game were, uh, how the game works, they'll pick one. Well, is this what happens in practice? Uh, no. Because, okay, the super, the, the smartest people in the room picks one, uh, picks one, but this is just calculations. Right? Maybe you don't even, uh, are not only doing calculations, but you're also really good at judging the other people that play the game. So you think, well, maybe they're not so sophisticated. They will pick something else. So it's about also thinking what other people think. And also thinking about how other people think what other people think. And this is sort of this simple game. The winner in the, in, in the, the Financial Times, I think, was 13, the winning number. Uh, so quite low. So thinking, OK, there's a lot of sophistication, but also some randomness. Uh, and I think this is sort of how you could think about these, these crypto markets now. It's not really doing calculations about what something is worth. It's really thinking what others think it's worth. Right? It's judging what other people are doing. Where the other people will still jump on uh, the bandwagon and will, will invest. And this is sort of the market you see now. Not really based on calculations yet, maybe some, but it's also a really lot of, of psychology, if you will. Really predicting uh, the, what other people will do. Okay, uh, some conclusions. It's hard to predict individual stock price movements. That's one thing I try to uh, convince you of. I'm not saying that, it's, that everything is perfectly rational. There are weird things, but overall, it's very hard to predict which stock will do well. From a scientific viewpoint, if you think of optimal portfolio theory, it's really about diversification. Right? Not putting all your eggs in one basket, but really diversifying between industries, countries, uh, and so on. Uh, I don't want to give investment advice, but if I would, then really do not uh, invest with money that, that you cannot miss. Uh, this, is, this is risky. Uh, you can easily lose your money. So if you got really interested in the stock market, do it with money you can miss. And there's really no guarantees. So even when researchers talk about the stock market, the average risk and returns, it's based on the past. Uh, we've done it carefully. So we've looked back uh, a long time back in the past. We looked at different countries. We did a lot of additional tests to sort of see what happens. But again, who knows what the future will bring? So it seems that in the long run, investing in shares is a very good strategy. Uh, but again, there are no guarantees. Stock prices do move up and down a lot. So thank you for your uh, attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. I can imagine that there are many questions, so um, I will start with one and then I uh, come with the microphone. Um, I was wondering, it has to do with the gamification and with uh, investing in crypto a bit, and maybe it's too, uh, too new something that, uh, that you can not answer, but is it new that uh, so many individuals are on the market and is it potentially dangerous because most of uh, the numbers that you named are, are uh, focused on the past 100 years, but is it possible that it completely changes from now on? Is it possible that it completely changes from now on? Uh, uh, yes, it is. It is possible. I guess that's the, uh, the safe answer. Uh, what you do see, so you also see uh, retail investors, so that's individual investors. Like in GameStop, there were huge amounts of retail investors. But the, the number of retail investors uh, se seems, to be, seems to be going up, the ones that invest. So in that sense, you could think maybe the stock market is changing and that is more also individual people's opinion. But on the same time, you see these institutions, these big, the pension funds that invest, they're still very big. And of course, if you 
by a tracker, if you buy an index, then they would have to invest in all these companies, so they would have the same returns at all these companies. So you'd also have a lot of these index investors, these mutual funds, also being very involved in stock markets. So in that sense, uh, it, it could change, but you still have, have so many sophisticated traders in the market that in the general stock market, say in the United States or in the Netherlands, uh, we don't expect, I, I guess I wouldn't expect big changes. But in new markets, yeah, it, it's, it's different. It, it could be a very different, uh, different game. Yeah. All right. Are there questions from the audience? My colleague will come your way. Thanks a lot. Um, I have a question regarding how can we, as, as let's say normal individuals, get the really important information, really big insights that, for example, pension funds have. So is there any, I don't know, any way that we can also arrive at the same uh, information? Right, so the information that the big investors like pension funds have. Uh, you shouldn't overestimate how well pension funds invest. They do not do much better than tracking the index. Right? And that's sort of a thing that, that comes out if, if you think about very, these very expensive, uh, or pension fund not, but also expensive mutual funds who, who think they know really well, who do a lot of research into which companies they should buy or not. On average, they don't do, don't do much better than the whole IX or, or the whole world index. So it, it also for them, is very hard to sort of outperform, to do better than uh, the, the general stock price movements. So it's not that they would, on average, have a lot of information that they could exploit, especially in that information that is relatively easy to get. Uh, but of course, the things they do is, is to go through the annual report. Right? If there's an annual meeting, to uh, go to the, the questions where, there's, where you can ask questions to, say, the, the CEO, the boss of the company, and, and see the answers or to read analyst reports. You have financial analysts who follow companies. They write reports on what they think, whether you should buy or not. So there is information there. But even with that information, it's not so easy to really outperform. So then still tracking the index, especially for a single person, seems optimal. Right? If they have 100 people doing the research, maybe. But for you, it seems like a very big investment for maybe a not so high return, additional return. Hey, thank you so much for uh, the insightful speech. Uh, I had one question regarding uh, today's actualities. So uh, it seems that we're entering the recession, right? Because of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine and uh, the stock market reflects that, uh, I think so pretty clearly. And what are your thoughts about the near future? Is it going uh, even more down, or is there going to be a rebound? Uh, uh, what, what are your thoughts for the near future? Thanks, yeah, that's a question to be expected, right? What will the stock prices do in the next month? I, I, I wish I knew. I, that's, I guess that's something that I, as an academic, have no clue. But even these, these, these people who claim they know, I don't think they do, right? This, this is just looking into uh, a crystal ball. Uh, what you do see is, is, yeah, the typically, of course, when there's a recession, stock prices go down, but it, it need not be the case anymore. You sometimes see things different. During the pandemic, right, a lot of companies were closed, were having trouble. Uh, you, you see the stock market, I think, in April 2020, March 2020, it, it, it went down quite a bit, but it recovered very, very quickly. I had stock prices already uh, towards the end of 2020, 2021, uh, basically went up a lot. So there there seemed to be a mismatch between people, well, business being closed and in misery and, and being on a lifeline and stocks being high. So it, it, it could go different ways because, again, stocks is all the expected profits in the future. So if you expect the pandemic to be short-lived, then maybe it doesn't matter so much because the profits in the future could still be high. So I guess that's why stock prices really reflect the future while the recession is really about maybe things that are going on now. So you could have indeed inflation and economic growth stalling, but stock price is still doing well. Uh, but who knows, because yeah, stock prices, they react quickly. Right? So now that you know this, you know we have, will have inflation and we, we have wars and, and we have uh, still parts of China being in lockdown, uh, you know this, but that should already be reflected in the current stock price. So that doesn't tell you anything about what will happen next. I wish I knew, then I... So at the end of the day, nobody knows, right? Even like, uh, like as you mentioned before, like the, the pandemic example, right? Everybody thought it, that it's going 
to be down and stay for there for a while, but it didn't happen, right? There are very, very few people who know. And I think even those, you can only sort of pinpoint them backwards, right, in hindsight. So now you can think about past crises and say, ah, oh, nobody saw it coming except these 100 people. But that's in hindsight, right? Uh, it, it's, it's really hard to predict. Yeah, I think so. When you look back, then it's easy to connect the dots, right? Yeah. All That's right. what we do, I guess, as academic researchers. We're very good at explaining why things happened, but we're, we're horrible at predicting what will happen. All right, good to know. Thank you so much. I think there are more questions upstairs. Yeah. Hi. It works. Hi. Yep. Hi. Yeah, I have a few questions. Um, first, um, I saw you give also a lecture to uh, University of the Netherlands. What's the difference between that lecture and this lecture? <laughs> uh, that, that was shorter. Yeah, that, that had to be in 15 minutes, but the, the message is the same. Okay, thank you. Uh, second, um, um, yes, we know you can be rich uh, from shares because the greatest example we all know, Warren Buffett. What are the uh, lessons we can learn from Warren Buffett? Uh, yeah, Warren Buffett. So, so there's indeed a few people who uh, do really, really well. Uh, and in the beginning, you should be skeptical, right? If uh, a thousand people invest in, in, in the stock market uh, and they take different strategies, so some predict it will go up, some will predict it will go down, then after a year, randomly 500 will be correct. Uh, the year after will be 250, the year 125. So even after many, many years, just by chance, some people will have uh, guessed correctly. Right? So if they're the ones that make the news, they're the ones who then start coming to you and saying, wow, look at what I did every year, then that need not be because they're super informed or super strong uh, uh, investors. They could have been lucky. Right? If somebody comes to you and say, oh, I bought this lottery ticket and I won the lottery, it's not like you think, oh, I should do this as well, right? This happens to everybody. No, this is the one person who won the lottery, and he's then the one talking you into it. So in that sense, even big success stories, uh, it could be due to luck. Of course, Warren Buffett, he has been doing this for many, many years. There are some people who have, yeah, who understand the market super well. Right? His strategy really to, to, to focus on, on value stocks, so not all these hypes, but really look carefully at the company's fundamentals, right? what they're doing. Uh, Compared to their profits, what is the stock price, their price earnings ratio, really looking at, at numbers, that's his strategy. Yeah, that, that has worked pretty well. So there could be individuals who really understand it well and, and, and do better than the average market. So then a lot of people would put their money in his hands. Right? To, so that's what he does. He, Berkshire Hathaway, his company invests for others. Uh, but I think he's the exception. Are there other questions? Hello. Okay. Thank you very much for the uh, short speech. I have a question. So if like for the next, I don't know, 60, 70 years, uh, I just invest like uh, a certain amount every month and the market would give the same returns, like, I don't know, five, six percent for the next 50, 60 years, will I be rich? Uh, yeah, you can calculate how much money you'll, uh, you'll have, right? So there's this, uh, these, these websites where you just you, you plug in the number you invest uh, each month or how, how often you want to do it. You plug in the expected return, and then it'll tell you how much you'll, uh, you'll get. Right? So if, if it was 100, euros, 100 years ago, it's worth more than 200,000 euros now if the ex expected return is 8%. Uh, so that's a lot of money. With inflation, of course, it, it, it's worth less. Uh, but that's something you can, you can do. So, of course, you need to predict what the expected return is in the future. We only know this from the past, so that's tricky. Uh, and, of course, you have to be careful in that the graph I showed is super smooth, but that's, of course, not what happens in practice, right? It goes up and down, up and down, up and down, but over time, it, there is an, an, an upward trend. But, yeah, you can do these, these calculations. You just need to know how much money you put in and what you expect as a return. Okay, and one follow-up to that. So, if we always look in the long term and... Um yeah, just not in the short term, but just in the long term. Uh, why isn't everybody then just investing and putting a certain amount, for example, in the S&P 500, if over the long, long term, you have like a guarantee that you get like, I don't know, 
Which yeah, one? so that was a good question. So, so that was the puzzle that, say, the finance literature had. Right? Why don't people invest more in the stock market? And that's why if people ask me these apps, well, I think that they, they have a very uh, a good component in them in that it makes it easier to invest in stock markets. And from a finance viewpoint, based on what we find, uh, it makes sense to invest in the stock markets in the long run. So uh, that, that's why it was a puzzle why people didn't. But of course, is it a puzzle, right? It, it, it's, people don't always understand or people don't always have the money to invest. Right? So there's a lot of uh, maybe knowledge still to spread. I guess that's why I'm giving this talk as well. A lot of uncertainty to take away or things to explain. Uh, so no, I think it's an excellent question. Why don't more, more people invest in the stock market? But you see more and more and more. Right? There's also studies there because I think, all right, don't people have the money? Don't people have the sophistication? So what, you would, what they would, for example, do in, in Scandinavia, where researchers have great data, they would see uh, somebody dying and then somebody inheriting a lot of money. Right? So their, their skill would remain the same. Their knowledge of the financial market would remain the same. Uh, pretty much their life would remain the same, except that they inherit a lot of money. And then you see, indeed, that it's much more likely that these people now invest in stock markets. So that basically having a windfall, having enough money, is, is uh, a prerequisite for, uh, for willing to uh, take the time to look into the stock market and invest. So that's one thing we need, you need, uh, right? Money to spare. But I think sophistication or understanding financial literacy, right? understanding a bit about the financial markets, uh, is useful. But I guess that's why my talk also tells you that you don't need to be an expert on all these stocks, or you don't need to follow the stock market every day. If you spread, if you buy an index, you don't have to be super financially literate to, uh, to make relatively uh, good investments. Thank you very much. There is one more question right in the middle. Thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering, sort of like besides all these um, averages from the past, are there like what are the arguments for us to assume that these um, returns will continue in the future? Uh, yeah, I don't think there are, right? It's, and I guess if you, if you would look at uh, uh, people trying to, to sell, uh, say, uh, assets to you or, or, or want you to invest in them, then it's something that they have to really uh, disclose, right? That returns in the past, uh, do not predict the future, and that is very, very true. Right? There's maybe no reason to predict it will be super different. Right? If this has been happening decade after decade after decade, then maybe uh, uh, the best prediction is that it will happen again. Right? If, if you live in, in Spain and it has been sunny, 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 then maybe your best prediction is that it will be sunny again. So I guess that's what uh, that researchers sort of do, right? Uh, sort of ex uh, extrapolate. But there's definitely no guarantees, right? Uh, it could be different. And especially if you think, OK, maybe now that more and more people put their money into stock markets, maybe the expected return goes down because there is so much supply of money, right? demand for shares. So uh, there, there, there's no guarantees that it will be, again, this, this 8%. But again, based on the past, it's likely that also in the next decade or two or three, uh, stock prices will, will go up. Yeah, but wouldn't there maybe be like a natural limit for how big a company could get? Let's say, how much more could Google grow or Amazon or Apple? Like, would yeah, there be a limit? Yeah, definitely. So, so it's, it's about diversification, right? No company from 100 years ago or very few from 100 years ago still exists now. Right? So Google will go bankrupt in the future as well. Uh, so it's, it's really about uh, spreading, right? That, that's, that's the key thing. Right? We know if you invest in a single stock, at some point you have to get out because indeed they mature. Uh, there will be more competition. In the end, they'll, they'll uh, they either divest, they spin off companies, or uh, uh, a lot of things will happen that make a company end. So I'm not saying that investing in a single stock would give this, but just keeping uh, invested in, say, an index. Right? An index always consists of the biggest companies. So if Google, in the far future, is not successful anymore and shrinks, they'll be out of the index, and they'll be replaced by a new company that does stuff uh, that does new stuff that people are interested in, where people do predict uh, uh, high profits and it has a high market valuation. So by investing in the index, you're also always investing in the stocks that are sort of big, that have a high market valuation at the time, market capitalization. Thank you. I have one more question. You uh, mentioned social, social investments or something like that, and uh, that's when I... Uh, when my eyes were open, because you say that uh, the average profit is no less, or assumably no less, than uh, with other 
uh, investments. But isn't it bad for the covariance if I put, for example, money in, in solar, uh, solar panels and windmills and we end up all using oil in the future? Right, yes, excellent question. And, and that's why I mentioned in there, because uh, based on the, the optimal portfolio theory, uh, you could indeed come up with this prediction, right? That when it's, uh, it's a lot about covariance and a lot about spreading, then it's optimal to also spread between, yeah, solar companies and companies that use oil, or uh, a lot of companies that really care for the environment and companies that can, do not care so much. Right? You want to maybe invest in tobacco, in drugs, uh, in war companies, because they do well when there's a war breaks out, uh, and opposite companies. So from an optimal portfolio theory, uh, this could be, could be uh, what, what we predict. But if you actually do these calculations and you take out all these war companies and tobacco companies and drugs companies and alcohol companies, uh, it turns out that it doesn't hurt you so much, that your average return and your average risk uh, is still very similar uh, than this portfolio where you also include these companies. So that the cost of social, socially responsible investing is not so high that you pretty much can expect almost the same return, it seems, right, based on the research we have so far, uh, as, 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 as not having this, this social component uh, added. Right, so in a way, when, when I, li I worked in Australia, for example, and then in your pension fund, you have to pick, do I want to be a, a socially balanced fund, invest in a socially balanced fund, or they invest for you, but socially balanced fund or not, then you sort of think, wow, maybe then I'm really restricted in the companies that I can invest in. But it turns out to be that, that you're still pretty well diversified if you pick such a fund. Right, so don't put all your money, that wouldn't be my, advise all your money in, in, in windmills or so, but still like a, a portfolio consisting of a lot of companies doing things that are relatively socially responsible, or at least that are not the same companies. Uh, financially, it, it doesn't seem to hurt you so much. All right, I think there's time for one more question, if there is one. Yeah. Yes, excuse me from uh, for my bluntness, but uh, I think so. I. I am pretty curious, and uh, also the audience, uh, you as a person who holds a PhD status, what was your best investment and what was your worst investment throughout your career, let's say? Uh, yeah, so th there's, there's no exciting answer, I'm afraid. So in the beginning, I just had fun buying single stocks, right? Uh, thinking, okay, this could be uh, a, a nice young company, I want to invest in that and, and track sort of uh, how, how the company was doing. Uh, and then, yeah, I went up a little bit or not, like nothing spectacular. Then uh, 2008, nine happened and stock markets went down a bit. Then it was sort of, it's called the ostrich effect. You basically put your hand in the, in the sand, right? You just stop looking at your returns like, ah, this is, this is terrible, I don't want to look at it anymore. And then afterwards I thought, well, let's just do what I, what we learn in finance, right, is to spread and buy an index. So that's what I've been doing for, for a long time now. And yeah, I just, whatever the, the world index is doing well, I guess I'm riding that, uh, these movements. So no cool story, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, good to know, thank you. Thank you, all of, all of you. Oh, sorry, can you maybe ask it later? <laughs> Thank you all of you for, uh, for being here uh, today. I'm very happy that you were all here. Give um, Patrick Verweimer one more hand of applause.